As you know, this is the final round of the Dean's Cup. The Dean's Cup is Duke Law's premier oral advocacy competition. Our finalists, our judges, our professors, everyone has come together to make this a special event, and we certainly hope you enjoy it. We're grateful for your attendance. I'd just like to thank a couple people on behalf of the board. My name is Chris Gerard. I'm the uh, president of the Moot Court Board here. And first and foremost, we'd like to thank Dean Levy. Your continuous support uh, has been fantastic and we're ever grateful. We'd also like to thank our faculty advisor, Professor Sean Andrew Sear, who selected this, process, this uh, problem and has been helpful to us in every interscholastic, all of our intramurals. We're very grateful, thank you. And uh, additionally, on behalf of the board, I would really like to thank the Dean's Cup coordinators, the three students to my right, uh, Nicola Felice, Adam Fine, and John Girl have put in countless hours to make this competition possible. Before I turn everything over to John, I'd like to make one final announcement. If everyone could please pull out your cell phones, turn them on silent, turn them off, put them on airplane mode, uh, whatever you need to do, we would be very grateful. This event will be recorded, and we would like to minimize any distractions. So once we get going, if you could please stay in your seats and stay in the room until the end of uh, arguments, we would be very grateful. So now, uh, John Girl to introduce the judges. Thank you all. Good evening, good evening everybody. Uh, we are honored to be hosting a panel of three distinguished judges for tonight's final round. Our presiding judge tonight is Justice Mark Martin. Justice Martin was appointed Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court in 2014 by Governor Pat McCrory after serving as an Associate Justice and Senior Associate Justice since his election to the North Carolina Supreme Court in 1999. He graduated from Western Carolina University in 1985 and from the University of North Carolina School of Law in 1988, and later earned a Master's of Law in Judicial Process from the University of Virginia. After graduating from law school, Justice Martin served as a law clerk for Judge Clyde Hamilton. Following his clerkship, he practiced law at the McNair Law Firm in Raleigh. He then served as legal counsel to James G. Martin, then governor of North Carolina, until his appointment in 1992 as resident superior court judge in Pitt County. From 1994 to 1999, he served as a judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Throughout his career, Justice Martin has taught law at NC Central, UNC, and Duke. We're also joined tonight by Judge Guy Cole, Jr. Judge Cole was nominated to the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit by President Clinton in 1995 and elevated to chief judge in 2014. He graduated from Tufts University in 1972 and Yale Law School in 1975. Upon graduating law school, Judge Cole practiced with the firm Voorhees, Sater, Seymour & Peace in Columbus, Ohio. He later joined the U.S. Department of Justice and worked as a trial attorney in the commercial litigation branch of the DOJ's Civil Division. Additionally, Judge Cole served as a U.S. bankruptcy judge for the Southern District of Ohio from 1987 until 1993. Throughout his career, Judge Cole has taught law at The Ohio State University's Morris College of Law. And rounding out our panel tonight is Judge Robert Hinkle. Judge Hinkle was nominated to the United States District Court for the Northern District of Florida by President Clinton in 1996, where he served as chief judge from 2004 until 2009. After, graduate, after he graduated from Florida State University in 1972, he graduated from Harvard Law School in 1976. After law school, Judge Hinkle served as a law clerk to Irvin Goldberg on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, worked in private practice in Atlanta, and later moved to Tallahassee where he continued to work in private practice until being nominated to the bench. Additionally, Judge Hinkle has served as adjunct professor of law at Florida State University. And now Nicola Felice will introduce our finalists. Pass down. Hi, everybody. Um, I have the honor of introducing our incredible finalists um, counsel for the petitioners, we have Chantelle Carlos. She's a 2L, um, graduated from the University of Florida, and before coming to Duke, um, participated in Teach for America. She also earned her master's degree in public policy and administration from Northwestern. Here at Duke, um, Chantelle is the incoming symposium editor for Law and Contemporary Problems, um, is also a member of the mock trial board, and a case manager for the Innocence Project. Jerna Shaw is a 3L from Manhattan. Um, she graduated from Yale with a double major in political science and international studies. And before coming to Duke, she worked as a political director on a congressional campaign and also as a research associate for the Poverty Action Lab in India. Here at Duke, Jerna is the editor-in-chief of the Duke Journal of Comparative and International Law. 
As counsel for the respondents, we have Logan Mose. Um, he is a 3L from Minnesota. He also attended Yale and majored in ethical philosophy. He worked on multiple political campaigns and also worked for an environmental advocacy organization before coming to Duke. Here at Duke, he is an executive editor for the Alaska Law Review and a senior research editor for the Law and Technology Review. Annie Showalter is a 2L from Florida, and she graduated from Wake Forest with a double major in English and philosophy. She's a JD LLM in International and Comparative Law and the incoming editor-in-chief of the Journal of Comparative and International Law. She's also a teaching assistant for the first year writing course. And now Adam Fine will introduce the problem. Thank you, Chris, John, and Nicola. I had the opportunity to introduce the problem this year. It's a problem that we're very excited about. It's of, of interest to me, and I think has been of great interest to all the competitors. Today's uh, issue is a Second Amendment challenge to a New Jersey law. Now, when you think about all the history of Supreme Court jurisprudence, it's rather remarkable that it wasn't until 2008 that the Supreme Court first directly considered the question of whether the Second Amendment confers an individual right to keep and bear arms. But uh, in the 2008 decision in District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court said that there was indeed an individual right embodied in the Second Amendment and struck down a law that prohibited District of Columbia residents from having operable handguns in their home. That right was then incorporated against the states in the 2010 decision, McDonald versus the city of Chicago. And since then, circuit courts have been struggling with exactly what the boundaries of this uh, right to keep and bear arms are. One of those circuits has been the Third Circuit. This is an appeal from the Third Circuit case of Drake versus Philco. And as I said, it presents a facial challenge to a New Jersey permitting law that requires citizens who have passed a number of other permitting requirements to demonstrate a justifiable need to carry a handgun before they can carry one lawfully outside of their homes and places of business. Um, in New Jersey, possession of a handgun without a permit is a, fel is a felony, uh, and applicants must demonstrate fitness requirements, including taking a training course, demonstrating knowledge of New Jersey's use of force laws, and a knowledge of the weapon that they plan to carry. Uh, after they've done all of these things, they must apply and demonstrate justifiable need, which is defined under the law as the urgent necessity for self-protection, as evidenced by specific threats or previous attacks, which demonstrate a special danger to the applicant's life that cannot be avoided by means other than by issuance of a permit to carry a handgun. The petitioners in this case want to carry firearms outside of their homes. They're not disqualified by any of the other statutory prohibitions, but have been denied based on a failure to demonstrate justifiable need. The respondents in this case are state officials charged with administering New Jersey's handgun permit law. The um, petitioners filed suit in the District of New Jersey seeking declaratory and injunctive relief. Um, on the ground that this law, the justifiable need requirement, violates their right to keep and bear arms. Um, the, uh, the state won in the lower court. The district court uh, dismissed the action. And then the, it was appealed to the Third Circuit. And the Third Circuit also ruled for the state, of the, the state officials of New Jersey. And it was then appealed to the en banc court. And in, in the real case, this case was denied cert by the Supreme Court, but obviously for purposes of our argument today, the Supreme Court granted certiorari. The two issues that will be considered today are first, does New Jersey's requirement that an applicant establish justifiable need to obtain a permit to lawfully carry a handgun outside the home burden conduct protected by the Second Amendment? And second, if it does burden such conduct, uh, is the requirement unconstitutional as a violation of the right to bear arms. Uh, last, before we begin argument, we'd like to say just a few special thank yous. Uh, uh, Professor Andrew Sear was, was thanked by Chris. He has been a great leader of this program and um, picked this, this problem. We'd also like to thank all of the judges who judged in the rounds, judges who graded briefs, judges who um, advised and, and gave feedback to the competitors, the finalists, on their briefs as well. Uh, special thanks goes to several professors who helped at multiple junctures. Um, we have uh, Judy Hammerschmidt, Professor Mullum, 
Professor Beal, Professor Young, Professor Bloker, Professor Metzloff, and Professor Miller. And we'd also like to thank the event staff and the Dean's Office, specifically Laura Grisham, Sandra McLaughlin, and Hannah Beardsley for all of their help, especially in preparing for this final round. And last, we'd like to thank Dean David Levy for his continued support of the Dean's Cup, as well as for the Moo Court Board and all of our activities in general. So without further delay, the 2015 Duke Law Dean's Cup. of Drake v. Filco and counsel for the petitioners may proceed. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Jerna Shaw, and along with my co-counsel, Chantal Carlos, I represent the petitioners in this matter. I will be addressing the scope of the Second Amendment right, and Ms. Carlos will address the constitutionality of New Jersey's justifiable need requirement. With the court's permission, we'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. When the American people ratified the Second Amendment, they made a choice. They elevated, above other government interests, the right of law-abiding citizens to keep and bear arms in self-defense. And yet, by requiring applicants to demonstrate a heightened or justifiable need, New Jersey has effectively deprived its citizens of that fundamental constitutional right. And just as a state cannot ask a citizen to prove she has a need to speak or to practice the religion of her choosing, New Jersey cannot require its citizens to demonstrate that they have a need to exercise a constitutional right. The requirement squarely burdens conduct protected by the Second Amendment as determined by its text, history, and tradition. In 2008, the Supreme Court recognized that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to keep and bear arms for self-defense. In reaching that conclusion, the Heller Court made two key observations. First, that self-defense is at the core of the Second Amendment guarantee. And second, that court should determine the scope of the Second Amendment based upon its text, its history, and its tradition. Didn't the counsel, didn't the court make, didn't the Heller Court make a distinction between keeping and bearing arms in the home as opposed to keeping and bearing arms outside the home? Your Honor, the Heller Court did not explicitly make any such distinction, but even though the court in Heller didn't address the scope of the right outside of the home, the court delineated and applied its understanding of the Second Amendment right to the facts of that case, which involved a challenge to the District of Columbia's handgun ban insofar as it prevented the plaintiff in that case from keeping a handgun in his home. I can be pretty sure when somebody has a gun at home that it's not offensive use, it's uh, uh, there for self-defense, leaving out domestic violence for just a moment. Uh, when someone's tri uh, driving down the street or walking down the street, how am I going to tell whether the gun is there for an offensive purpose or a defensive purpose? Your Honor, we recognize that the state has a greater interest in public safety once the individual is outside the home, and that it's not easy to tell when an individual will use the gun for offensive or defensive purposes once they're outside of the home, although we would agree with Your Honor that there are the same restrictions once we're inside the home to know how exactly the gun would be used. But there's a distinction between how the gun will be used and whether the individual has a Second Amendment right to carry it. So just because you don't have the right to use the arm doesn't mean that you shouldn't have the right to carry it in the rare circumstances where the need to use that arm will arise. And I'll give you an example to illustrate this point. It would be incongruent with the history and the text of the Second Amendment to say that a nurse who works in Newark and who has to walk home through a high crime area in a dangerous neighborhood late at night after a night shift is not entitled to have a gun as a matter of the Second Amendment to protect herself as she is walking through this neighborhood but that she may have that gun once she is safely within the confines of her home. And it's Surely she has no greater right walking through the neighborhood than the person who lives in the neighborhood. Your Honor, we would contend that the person who lives in the neighborhood and the person who walks through the neighborhood have the same Second Amendment right to bear arms in self-defense for lawful purposes. 
but we acknowledge that the distinction between the inside the home and outside the home exists insofar as the public has a greater interest in regulating the right once an individual is outside the home. But in order for this court to reach that question, uh, we believe that this court needs to first decide that the individual has the right uh, within the public sphere. And any concerns that this court may have about whether or not the individual, uh, the public's interest in safety is greater should be deferred to the scrutiny inquiry. This court shouldn't take a distorted reading of the text and the history of the Second Amendment right, which would very clearly show that individuals have always had some kind of right to carry arms in public for lawful self-defense. But this court may account for the state's greater concerns in public safety by using a standard of scrutiny that may be more favorable to the government. Was it the, oh, sorry. So what is wrong with a world where we, we limit our core fundamental right to the home as we did in Heller, and allow legislative determinations as to striking the balance for when weapons can be carried out in public. Your Honor, we believe that limiting the core of the right to the home would be incongruent with Heller's language itself, which says that the core of the right is self-defense. Heller calls self-defense an inherent lawful right, the core component of the right, and says that- Well, I thought I said the core was hearth and home. Not exactly, Your Honor. The court said that the right uh, was certainly guaranteed if it was to use the handgun for defense of hearth and home. But any time the court discusses the word core or self-defense, those two words are often found together, and they aren't included in the, in the court's discussion of the home. Heller's opinion in part two largely talks about the scope of the right, and in nowhere in that portion of the opinion does the court talk about being in the home as a precondition to the exercise of the right. The historical sources that Heller cites and the textual arguments that it makes are quite similar to the ones that we would make here. We believe that a lot of the commentators that Heller tracked in order to determine that the Second Amendment right is an individual one are also the same legal commentators who would say that the right had some application in the public sphere. And I'll give you some examples. So for example, William Rawl and John Ordronox were two 18th and 19th century commentators who noted that men routinely went armed in public. St. George Tucker, a noted anti-federalist and legal commentator, noted that in many parts of the United States, a man doesn't think about going outside of his house without his rifle or his musket, that possession of arms was indispensable to early colonists, and that men went armed into the fields and to church. It isn't unusual for individuals to have the right to carry an arm in public. And even today, 40 states don't require any kind of showing in order to obtain a handgun permit, any kind of showing that's similar to the justifiable need standard that's at issue here in this case today. But counsel, isn't it accurate that the state of New Jersey has for 90 or 100 years has some sort of regulation of uh, the carrying of guns outside the home? And there may be some distinction between concealed and open carry over those years, but it's a pretty long-standing practice, one could argue, that there's this sort of regulation. Your Honor, we would disagree that the regulation qualifies as longstanding. We do so for two reasons. First, because uh, when we talk about a regulation being longstanding, we're talking about, in most circuits, exempting that type of regulation from any type of constitutional scrutiny under the Second Amendment. So in order for regulation to be longstanding, we believe that it has to have both historical depth and geographic breadth or some kind of widespread acceptance. And the justifiable need requirement does not meet either of those two prongs. We believe that the need requirement only dates back to 1971, when the New Jersey State Supreme Court said that need would be defined as an urgent necessity for self-defense. It's at that moment that the court imposed this heightened need requirement upon applicants in the state of New Jersey. And we do believe that the distinction between open and concealed forms of carry is actually quite salient here, because up until 1966, individuals in New Jersey could carry openly without a permit when the state extended permitting requirements to both open and concealed forms of carry and then said that you had to meet a heightened showing of carry, it effectively told most law-abiding citizens that they had no avenue by which they could vindicate their Second Amendment rights. The standard, as the state has defined it, is that you could not avoid the harm that is about to befall you, that it is virtually so certain to exist that you would have the need to use a handgun. And that's simply too overbroad when we're talking about the fact that historically the right has been understood to allow the vast majority of citizens to be able to exercise some kind of constitutional right 
to carry arms on their person for lawful self-defense. Well, at least 1966, you've had uh, this requirement. And what is, what is wrong with the idea of requiring an justifiable need to carry a handgun into public? We believe, Your Honor, that when the state asks individuals to demonstrate a justifiable need, it's essentially flipped the presumption that you are entitled to your constitutional rights and that the state may impose some regulations based upon its compelling interests. In this case, New Jersey is telling citizens that they are not entitled to their constitutional rights unless they can meet a standard that virtually no citizen can meet. And that's pretty much circular, and we're trying to decide what the constitutional right is. It doesn't help to say they're being denied it. Would you at least agree that uh, the, the risk to one walking the streets would have been different at the end of the 18th century than it is today? Absolutely, Your Honor. We would take no uh, issue with the fact that the risks posed uh, in the public sphere have changed from the founding era to today. And, and in some places, at least, it's a lot less today. I mean, maybe, maybe in downtown Trenton, and maybe it's worse. But, uh, but there are certainly places in New Jersey where the risk is much less today than it was then. True? Perhaps, Your Honor, but it doesn't justify creating different constitutional standards based on perhaps population density, for instance. The right has to be equally applied across all areas, and then New Jersey may regulate that right based upon its varying concerns in different areas. But why can't the legislature decide that out in some pristine part of New Jersey, we're told there are such, <laughs> where there might have been a risk of a bear back at, at the late 18th century, now there's very little risk. Uh, why can't the legislature decide that you ought not be able to carry a gun there, that the other people going to that pristine park today would rather not have other people out there with guns? Well, Your Honor, in the instance where we're talking about a park or a public space, the <laughs> Court, the New Jersey State Legislature may be able to create some kind of exception by calling it a sensitive place, which is a type of, of regulation that Heller has deemed to be longstanding. But absent that, we believe that the individual who lives in that area, for example, should still have the right to carry the gun on his person when he goes in public, just simply because he won't always be in that park at all times. He may work in Newark. He may uh, have a friend or travel across the state. And in all of these instances, he's not able to predict when his need to defend himself will arise. And if he's able to have the gun on his person, he may defend himself when that happens. But if the New Jersey State Legislature says he's not entitled to that gun at all, then he's never going to have the opportunity to defend himself when the need arises, and his Second Amendment right has been effectively <coughs> deprived. Now, when we're talking about longstanding regulations, like things, uh, regulations that exempt sensitive places, for example, those types of regulations have founding era analogs. They have enjoyed a widespread geographic acceptance. And the justifiable need requirement has failed to do that in any form. There is no longstanding tradition of conditioning your public right to carry upon a heightened showing of need. Why should we have a broad right under Heller outside the home? In Florida, two and a half million people avail themselves of this permitting right. What if the people of New Jersey do not want this many guns out in the public sphere? Your Honor, it seems that the people of New Jersey uh, haven't been able to have the opportunity to really weigh in on this issue simply because uh, the state Supreme Court has set the standard. But we think that if we go back to the example of the nurse in Newark, that's the type of individual who should have a Second Amendment right to carry a gun on her person for self-defense. and. By being overbroad, the New Jersey State Legislature has effectively deprived her of that right. Now, we don't contest that New Jersey has to be able to regulate uh, gun, gun carry in public in some manner, but we take issue with how they plan to do it. And as my co-counsel will explain in a moment, uh, that type of determination is best left to scrutiny, but the text and the history and the tradition of the Second Amendment speak quite clearly and when, with one voice. Your Honor, I see my time has expired. May I very briefly conclude? Yes, you may. The Second Amendment clearly extends outside of the home, and New Jersey's regulation must withstand constitutional scrutiny in order to survive. No, thank, thank you, you Counsel. Merci. Chief Justice Martin, Your Honors, and may it please the Court. My name is Chantal Carles, counsel for the petitioners. 
There exist in our society two kinds of interests, those of the individual and those of the state. This case emerges in the instances where those two interests are in conflict. New Jersey's justifiable need requirement is the state's regulatory attempt to secure its interest in public safety. But the need requirement is regulating a person's Second Amendment interest in being able to carry a gun for lawful self-defense. And as such, under our jurisprudence, the need requirement must undergo meaningful judicial review to determine its constitutionality. And here, Your Honors, the need requirement fails under any heightened standard of scrutiny. Well, let's assume it's intermediate scrutiny. Why is it not a reasonable determination that if we require justifiable need, we'll have fewer guns out in the public, and that's a good thing? Um, one key reason we can't come to that conclusion, Chief Justice Martin, is the fact that the state of New Jersey here has provided this court with no evidence on which to make the determination whether it's in fact reasonable that by conditioning the exercise of the Second Amendment on a justifiable need requirement does indeed lead to less violence on the streets of New Jersey. Well, the regulation, the court decisions all predate Heller, so how would the state have really uh, put together this type of information in support of its uh, Proffer. In other words, Heller came after uh, the regulations were promulgated. Uh, the standard was enunciated by the Supreme Court. That's true, Your Honor. Um, but the states have been regulating the Second Amendment for many years prior to Heller. And here, the state had the opportunity in the various rounds of litigation prior to today to pr pr produce evidence not only that the legislator looked at when they produced this standard, but also to any evidence at all to support uh, how this is a reasonably necessary way uh, to decrease violence on the streets. How about the testimony in Sicardi? Can't, can't I go look at the testimony in Sicardi for uh, all of this? Well, Your Honor, even assuming that a simple citation to Sicardi in the district court opinion is sufficient to bring all that testimony here on the record, at most what that, those studies and that testimony tell us is that fewer guns may lead to fewer violence. But they don't go so far as to show that the need requirement is a reasonably necessary way to decrease violence. Well, can't we infer that the, that the need requirement is necessary? I mean, since 1924, there has been some sort of a need requirement. So you have like 90 years of legislation in, in New Jersey uh, having this need requirement. So isn't that enough of an inference, even, even if there's not actual empirical data? Well, Justice Cole, as my co-counsel mentioned earlier, the need requirement has existed since the early 1920s, but it has evolved to a point where it became a different standard once it was conditioned on an urgent necessity. Um, and that we also began to apply to both open and concealed. So the regulation on its face became much more stringent. And while we can draw that that's a reasonable inference, the state still has to show that today it's met its burden that the justifiable need requirement continues to be reasonably necessary. Now, we contend that the court actually need not even reach the question of constitutional scrutiny in this case and do a heller. Find that the justifiable need requirement here is so antithetical to the Second Amendment that it can withstand no form of constitutional scrutiny. And definitely, while on its face it's not a complete prohibition as a District of Columbia's law was in Heller, this court did note in Heller that a law that uh, functions on its face as a regulation but in effect is a de facto prohibition for citizens to exercise their Second Amendment right, it makes it unconstitutional no matter what standard the court applies. Well, what makes it an absolute prohibition? Everybody can keep a gun in their home. Everybody can keep a gun at work. Uh, you, and you can take it back and forth in between. Uh, you, you just can't carry it on the street. Isn't that what this says? Uh, well, Justice Hinkle, those uh, exceptions to the need requirement and where the places and the times that a person can carry a gun may preserve small pockets of freedom. But the Second Amendment is an individual right to self-defend, as this court defined. And the need to self-defend, as my co-counsel mentioned earlier, doesn't simply evaporate the moment a person process over the threshold of their home into those public spaces. And for a person to truly be able to exercise their right to self-defend, they need to be able to carry that arm, no matter whether they're in their home, their places of business, or on the streets of New York or Camden. They have to be able to have that right whenever they come face to face with confrontation. Would you agree that that right is more narrow outside the home, wouldn't you? I mean, that that's not as powerful or strong a right outside the home. 
Justice Cole, I think that would be in line with, with this court's language in Heller that I think the Second Amendment is at its zenith in the home, though that didn't necessarily mean there was no right to self-defend in public. So if the court is concerned about the fact that there are distinctions between the public and private spheres, intermediate scrutiny may be more appropriate here, as uh, Justice Martin mentioned earlier. Um, and even if this court were to take that more favorable standard to the government, we would still be entitled to prevail, which brings me to my first Point that I discussed a little bit earlier. We don't Let me contest. Ask a question. Maybe the first point. It may be a different one. You you cast this as an issue between the uh, person who wants to carry the gun and the state. Do, do you give any weight at all? Do you acknowledge there's any weight at all to the interests of another individual, the the person at the coffee shop who doesn't have a gun and would prefer to be sitting sitting at the bench having uh, morning breakfast without somebody next at the next uh, booth or the next seat, who's armed? Is there any interest in the, in, in the person not to be in, a, in a, a cafe while other people are packing? Indeed, Your Honor. And our society is marked by dueling interests, and they have to accommodate those interests. But at, at the core is the fact that the founders elevated among the, above the right of the person sitting at the coffee shop having breakfast, to not sit next to someone who's armed. They elevated the right of the person sitting next to them to be able to have that gun if they pass um, all the other regulations in place, and they do so in a safe manner, to have that gun to be able to defend themselves. If somebody came in and testified, that you complain about the lack of evidence, if somebody came in and testified mm -hmm. that the person at the, at the counter at the, in the cafe was more likely to use a gun for an offensive purpose than a defensive purpose, or, or was 30% as likely or 40% as likely, could the legislature not do anything to try to prevent the offensive use of that gun, the offensive carrying of that gun? Not necessarily, Your Honor. Uh, we talk about percentages. For us, it's still concerning that the state of New Jersey here is conditioning the exercise of a fundamental right on need. But that doesn't mean that the state of New Jersey doesn't have other avenues by which to ensure that that person isn't offensively packing a gun. To well, use what are those? The state of New Jersey, uh, Justice Hinkle, already has in place many of those uh, criminal background check, uh, character references, safety courses that the person must pass with certain qualification scores. We do not take issue with those because, again, we recognize that the state of New Jersey has a compelling state interest here. Have you, have you made any survey of how many of the people in the, in the recent mass shootings would have met all of those criteria? Unfortunately, surely some. Um, logically, we can assume that perhaps some of them had. And we're not saying that uh, other alternatives are going to be perfect regulations. I don't think that there can be perfect gun regulations, but the presumption has to be in favor of an individual to have the gun in the first place, as the Second Amendment says, and the state can th therefore work backward from that presumption and carve out certain sensitive areas or other restrictions that the person must meet. But here, the state has failed to show that conditioning a person's uh, height, conditioning the exercise of the right on heightened need is at all related, if at all tenuously related, to their stated interest in public safety. Heightened need isn't predictive of whether a person is going to misuse, accidentally use that gun. Take, for example, Mr. Fenton here, one of the petitioners. He's a part-time deputy sheriff with arrest powers who can carry a gun while he's on duty. How is the state to know that he's more likely to misuse or accidentally use a gun simply because he hasn't been able to demonstrate a heightened need to self-defend? I, I, I mean, another question, how's the state to know? How, how is it, when there's trouble in the cafeteria or the school library, the university library or whatever, uh, and the law enforcement officer shows up, how is the law enforcement officer to know which of these armed people is the bad guy and which is the good guy? Isn't there some advantage to having fewer people on the scene with guns? Your Honor, there may be an advantage to have few, fewer people at the scene with guns, but the way that New Jersey has gone about ensuring that there are fewer guns at the scene is too broad of an approach to survive intermediate scrutiny. And that's true for three reasons. As I mentioned earlier, simply because a person has heightened self-defense need doesn't mean that they're going to be more likely to be the bad guy in that cafe. 
And moreover, Justice Martin, for example, brought up the fact that in Florida, there have been over two and a half million permits issued since 1987. And only 168 of those have been taken away because a person in a cafe, for example, or in some of the other uh, public spaces of, of the state of Florida misused that gun. That comes out to less than one one thousandth of a percent. So if we look at the actual impact of the need requirement here, we don't know if it moves the dial anywhere near forward toward a greater public safety on the streets. Well, you've conceded that there is a lesser right outside the home. And the zenith of this right as a core fundamental right under the Second Amendment is premised in the home. Now, what is wrong with allowing states to try to balance the interest on the outside? Here you have the end promoting public safety. Uh, you have the means using who needs to have a gun in public. And what's wrong with the fit and how that works? Well, I, there are a few things that's wrong with the fit. First, and really briefly, the state hasn't given no evidence whether there's any fit at all. Um, but secondly, demonstrating need doesn't necessarily reduce that the, like, the likelihood that the gun is going to be used violently. And the absence of evidence, this court isn't um, provided with any information to make that decision. And moreover, the Constitution tells us that the state cannot ex ante take away a constitutional right simply because they have deemed the right itself to be dangerous. And the court, ha the state of New Jersey has to function from the presumption that the uh, individuals of New Jersey have that right and then work from there to regulate that right as they see fit. Now the state of New Jersey here says that common sense is sufficient to find that this is a reasonably necessary regulation. But common sense does not explain why a person who has heightened need to self-defense is less likely to misuse or accidentally use that gun. Common sense is not sufficient to explain why Mr. Fenton or Mr. Salerno, an electrical contractor who travels to the dangerous neighborhoods of New Jersey at odd hours, why those two gentlemen are le more likely to use a gun simply because they couldn't prove to the state of New Jersey that they have a heightened need to protect themselves. I go, I go back to my question about Mr. Salerno. Uh, I mean, it, it, it seems to make a sympathetic case that he's an electrical contractor and he has to go into these dangerous neighborhoods. You, you realize there are a lot of people who live in the dangerous neighborhood. I, I don't understand why Mr. Salerno gets to arm himself, but the people who live there don't get to arm themselves. And, and if they get to arm themselves, surely everybody gets to arm themselves. Um, well, Justice Hinkle, it's to the person's decision whether they'd like to arm themselves. And we think that whether they're living in that neighborhood or there's someone like Mr. Salerno coming in from the outside, they all have a presumptive right under the Second Amendment to arm themselves. And this I mean, you really are asking. I mean, you, you can pick Mr. Salerno out as, a, as a, uh, a sympathetic example. You really are saying everybody in the state, as long as they haven't been convicted and, and they have to be able to shoot the guns you know, past the test, but you're really saying everybody in the state gets to carry a gun on, on the street, in, in the public park, in, the, in my cafeteria. They, they get to carry a gun. That really is your position. Not necessarily. Uh, the, like my co-counsel said, the state of New Jersey can carve out certain sensitive places like public parks. It can condition whether a person can have that gun in the first place on all the other restrictions they've already leveled at the individuals of New Jersey. But, that, but those are really pretty minor. I mean, uh, most everybody, every, everybody in this room could, get, could have a gun. That's true, Your Honor. And the Second Amendment says that if everyone in this room is a law-abiding citizen of the state of New Jersey, they're presumed to have the freedom and the ability and the right to carry a gun for the purposes of lawful self-defense. So what is not reasonable, then, about a determination that to bring down the quantity of guns in public to only limit it to those who can show the justifiable need standard? Because, uh, Justice Martin, by simply saying that lowering guns means uh, fewer deaths on the street, that's, again, a very broad approach to empowering or in ensuring the safety of the citizens of New Jersey. And that cannot be a reasonably necessary way to do so. The state of New Jersey has to first provide this court with evidence that conditioning it on need is a way to lower guns in the first place on the street. Now you keep referring to evidence, and I understand that argument, but what sort of evidence would you envision? What sort of data could the state of New Jersey provide that would be sufficient? 
Justice Cole, the state of New Jersey can provide any sort of empirical evidence, whether it be studies, whether it be statistics from other states that have similar restrictions in place and how those have in some way decreased handgun violence. How about just the testimony of a law enforcement officer? Your Honor, that may not be sufficient. One law enforcement officer's testimony, but at least that would be some evidence. But again, here on the record for which this court has to make a decision, I see my time has expired. May I briefly conclude? You may. But, I, but here on the record, there is not even one officer's testimony for this court to look at. Because the state of New Jersey has relegated the Second Amendment right to a second-class right subject to different rules, the need requirement is unconstitutional, and this court should strike it down and find in favor of the petitioners. Thank you. All right. Thank you, counsel. All right. Counsel for respondents may proceed. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Ann Showalter, and together with my co-counsel, Logan Mose, we represent the respondents in this matter. I will discuss the fact that the need requirement falls outside of the Second Amendment scope, and my co-counsel will explain that even assuming a burden on protected conduct, the requirement passes means end scrutiny. Your Honors, this is a case about New Jersey's ability to protect its citizens from deadly harm through regulation. It's about the justifiable need requirement, which falls outside of the scope of the Second Amendment for two reasons. The first is that the requirement is part of a tradition of public regulation that's carved out of the scope of the Second Amendment right. And the second is that the justifiable need requirement in particular is a longstanding regulation. Now, a fresh historical inquiry is necessary here because Heller does not resolve this case. This court held there that responsible, law-abiding citizens have a right to keep and bear arms for self-defense within their homes. And it's true, as the petitioners stated, that this court observed that self-defense was the central component of the Second Amendment right. But reasoning from that statement to the conclusion that the right is equally potent in the public sphere overlooks indications in Heller that the right is qualitatively different in public. Well, in Heller, we, we cited two commentators from the 19th century that uh, talked about uh, longstanding uh, exceptions to the right. How could you really maintain that uh, this just goes back to 1966, the justifiable need? How does that really fall within a longstanding uh, customer practice? Well, Your Honor, this court listed several longstanding regulations in Heller, including prohibitions on possession by felons and by the mentally ill. Now, the, the uh, felons goes back to the early 20th century again, uh, long before 1966. Yes, Your Honor. And this court didn't announce a test for longstandingness, but the regulations that it did name have two qualities. And the first is that they're rooted in a historic tradition that speaks to the scope of the right. And the second is that those regulations in particular have long received continuous public assent. Now, yes, Your Honor. If you finish with the answer to the Chief Justice's question. I, I have a different question. Both, both sides talk in the briefs about long, long standing as if somehow that affects the constitutional analysis. I understand that it matters uh, what was common back when the founders wrote the Second Amendment, and I understand that it may make a difference what the situation was when the 14th Amendment was adopted that incorporates the Second. Other than that, I, I have some difficulty trying to understand why it makes a difference, whether the law that we're dealing with is uh, of long standing. Well, that's why we think that the first half of the long standingness inquiry has to necessarily speak to the scope of the right at the founding, because this court was clear about the fact that the Second Amendment codified a pre-existing right to keep and bear arms. And the justifiable need requirement here is part of such a historic tradition, the tradition of regulation in the public sphere, which goes to the very scope of the Second Amendment right outside of the home. Then it grew out of that tradition and has existed since 1924 when New Jersey chose to enact it. And in that way, it's very similar to the felon in possession ban. The great weight of the history shows that there are no exact analogs to the felon in possession ban that we have today. Instead, it was rooted in a general tradition of conditioning carry on a citizen's virtue. And out of that broader tradition grew the felon in possession ban that we have today, which is now applied to nonviolent felons, something that the founders certainly would not have anticipated. But Your Honor, it's not, necessarily to, it's not necessary to make this finding on that narrow ground. 
And if this court chooses to, we can look to the tradition of public regulation that began in 1328 with the statute of Northampton. That statute was a British statute, and it prohibited riding or going armed in public. And it's significant for our purposes because it went to the scope of the English right to arms. And this court recognized in Heller that that right was the direct predecessor of the American Second Amendment. So the what, did, what did that really mean? Um, you, did, uh, I mean, I, I read this in, in your brief. There's a statute in Northampton in the 14th century that prohibits going armed in public. Uh, nobody went armed in public for, from, for the next several hundred years after that? They could go armed in public with a government license, Your Honor. The, significant of the, stat the significance of the statute is that it informed the scope of the English right. So it was a right not to be free from government regulation in public, even though it included the ability to carry in public. And that goes straight to the content of our Second Amendment right. It speaks to the fact that the founders understood when they discussed the right to keep and bear arms, that the right was one to carry arms in public for self-defense, but not to do so free from government regulation. And that is why New Jersey's requirement is constitutional, because it's born out of that same tradition that goes straight to the scope of the right. And that tradition continued in the Americas. In fact, three colonies incorporated the statute of Northampton in their Second Amendment analogs. And there were laws both predating and postdating the ratification of the Second Amendment that show that it was commonly regulated in public, particularly in populous areas. For example, we have a 1783 law that prohibited carrying loaded firearms within the city of Boston. And that tradition wasn't limited to the East Coast. As the western half of the Americas... Why? Justice Stevens talked a good bit about that in Heller, uh, but apparently made no impact at all on the majority. Your Honor... Aren't you just rehashing Justice Stevens' rejected argument? No, Your Honor, Justice Stevens used a different portion of a Boston law that discussed the prohibition on carrying loaded arms within the home. And Justice Scalia rejected that argument. What this example goes to is a tradition of regulation throughout the public sphere. And that tradition was much more widespread. And it continued as we settled the western half of the United States. For example, in Dodge City, Kansas, and in Tombstone, Arizona, two very famous examples, citizens were required to check their arms at the city limits. And that tradition of public regulation continued throughout the 19th century. As this court's majority observed in Heller, most courts that considered complete prohibitions on concealable weapons during the 19th century upheld those as constitutional. The justifiable need requirement is constitutional because it, too, is part of that tradition of public regulation, which is carved out of the very scope of the Second Amendment. In very few states, you have 40 shall-issue jurisdictions. Prior to 1966, New Jersey re residents could carry a, could bear a gun openly in public. And now with the justifiable need requirement, New Jersey finds itself in a very small number of states in terms of burdening the right to their citizens to exercise the right we enunciated in Heller and applied to the states of McDonald. Your Honor, we contend that we should look at states that are similarly situated. So New Jersey is the most densely populated state in our union. And if we look at the 10 most po densely populated states in the US, seven out of those 10 have a need requirement like that enacted in New Jersey. And that is an extremely salient fact, because the values that underlie the principles of federalism are particularly important in the Second Amendment context. Here, what we have is a right that is not a right to be free from regulation in the public sphere. It is a regulated right when you step outside of your home, and it is up to the states to decide, while tracking the content of the Second Amendment right, the interest in self-defense, what sort of regulations they deem fit in order to protect the public. The sorts of laws that we think would proceed straight to means and scrutiny would be prohibitions on the exercise of the right, or de facto prohibitions on your ability to carry a handgun. So you clearly have a good motivation uh, protecting public safety, but the record seems to be devoid of real evidence that uh, this uh, means is really bringing about or promoting public safety. So is that is that really reasonable for this court just to accept your proffered justification? Your Honor, my co-counsel is going to discuss extensive evidence, including the Sicardi case, anecdotes, consensus, modern surveys, all of which support the contention that this was a reasonable decision 
on the behalf of the New Jersey legislature in a decision which, according to this court's jurisprudence, is deserving of substantial deference. But that question doesn't necessarily go to the scope of the right. The regulation here shouldn't even be subjected to means and scrutiny because it is a mere regulation on the ability to carry in public where the right is not a right to be free from government regulation. Instead, the state has a vested interest in protecting the person who might be standing behind the nurse from Newark when she hears a car backfire, fears she's being shot at, and turns around and uses her handgun on an innocent person. In New Jersey, the state of New Jersey has the right and the ability to regulate the Second Amendment outside of the home to protect those citizens. Now, if this court is uncomfortable holding that there is a tradition of public regulation that's carved out of the scope of the Second Amendment right, it can hold more narrowly that the justifiable need requirement in particular is carved out of the scope of the Second Amendment right. And that would go to the longstandingness point that I was addressing earlier. It's possible just to hold that this requirement in particular is longstanding, and that would require the two things I mentioned. First, I, 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 go, I go back to this long, longstanding. I mean, the, the majority opinion in Heller says, well, there are some longstanding statutes that we don't question. And all of a sudden, we try to make that into the legal standard. I, I, why isn't it like me going and looking at the parking lot, and there's a... a cars out there, and one of them's a red Corvette, and I say, I bet that red Corvette is fast. I don't think it's fast because it's red. He, he said these are longstanding statutes that are constitutional. He didn't say they're constitutional because they're longstanding. He, he just described them. They are longstanding. Well, why does it matter to the constitutional analysis whether these statutes were adopted yesterday or 200 years ago? Some later remarks by Justice Scalia shed some light on that question, Your Honor. In his concurrence in McDonald, Justice Scalia wrote that there would be opportunity in later cases to expound on the historical justifications for longstanding regulations, which speak to the fact that there are exceptions to the Second Amendment right. So that comment makes clear that the historical justifications for longstanding regulations go to the fact that they're carved out of the scope of the Second Amendment right that those particular regulations are removed from the ambit of the Second Amendment because they grow out of longstanding historical tra traditions and because they, in particular, have received continuous public assent. And that is the case when we look at New Jersey's law. It's rooted in the tradition of public regulation that I've just canvassed for this court. And it grew out of that tradition and was enacted in 1924 by the state of New Jersey. And the New Jersey Supreme Court has recognized in several cases that the substance of that requirement has remained unchanged from 1924 until the present day. Well, hasn't the justifiable component been a fairly recent addition? The language justifiable need was a recent addition. But the court in subsequent cases and the legislature in the legislative history was clear about the fact that enacting that language did not change the substance of the standard that courts had been applying to determine justifiable needs since 1924. And that's significant because the New Jersey legislature vested the decision of whether or not justifiable need was present with the court system. It's not a legislative determination. A superior court judge is the one who makes the final determination about whether or not justifiable need is present. And they've stated, even in 2014, that they've been doing that using the exact same substantive standard since 1924. It is, it, this justifiable need standard prohibits almost everyone from possessing a, a gun away from home or, or business or owned property. True? I mean, it, 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 these are pretty good plaintiffs. If these, if these people can't get it, almost everybody is prohibited. Your Honor, we have no statistics on the record, but it would prohibit everyone who can't reach what we recognize as a high burden. However, what's important isn't the number of people who can satisfy the standard. What's important is the fact that the people who can satisfy the standard are those who can show that what they're actually doing with that gun is exercising their protected Second Amendment right to defend themselves. The Second Amendment doesn't protect your right to carry a handgun for offensive uses or because you've always thought that it would be neat to have a handgun in your purse. What it protects is your right of self-defense. And this how, about, is, how about a federal judge? You know, a federal judge in New Jersey carry a gun? If that federal judge could show that there were the sort of objective threats to his life 
that ensured that his carry tracked the amendment. And judges that get assassinated, probably uh, very few of them could show an objective. I mean, the, the recent attacks on federal judges, it, 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 nobody knew they were going to be attacked. Your Honor, there are going to be some imperfections to any ex-ante regulation. We recognize the fact that, that objective need to carry a handgun can arise in an instant. So any determination beforehand isn't going to be perfectly predictive of the reality. But this is the only way that the state of New Jersey can make sure that individuals are actually exercising their Second Amendment right to defend themselves from real threats, rather than carrying guns for offensive purposes. You're characterizing a very narrow right. And how, how, how is that uh, work in tandem with the 19th century commentators that we talked about in terms of the scope of this right historically? It works in tandem with those commentators because we are recognizing that individuals have a right to arm themselves for self-defense. We don't dispute that that exists outside of the home, which goes to the heart of the contentions of those 19th century commentators. What we're positing is that there's a somewhat more nuanced, may I complete, briefly yes, respond? Is that there's a somewhat more nuanced reality here, which is that the history also shows that regulation in the public sphere is part of the right. Because the justifiable need requirement is both longstanding and part of a tradition of public regulation, its constitutionality should be affirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. <clears throat> Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Logan Mose, co-counsel for the respondents. Ms. Showalter has just explained why the permit law in this case does not burden the Second Amendment. What I'm here to discuss is why, even if this court assumes this is, that the Second Amendment is burdened, the law still passes muster and is constitutional. Doing that requires performing a means and analysis, but before I get into that, I'd like to address something that opposing counsel mentioned, which is this idea that uh, perhaps means and means ends analysis is inappropriate, uh, as she put it, doing a Heller. Uh, but that's not what Heller did, Your Honors. Heller specifically said that rational basis review was inappropriate in the Second Amendment context, but that under any of the remaining standards of review this court traditionally uses, uh, the law uh, in that case failed. It would be odd for this court to have specifically said rational basis review doesn't apply, and then implicitly also reject intermediate and strict scrutiny. Uh, and, and so we shouldn't assume today that that's what happened. The Heller court uh, clearly commanded that means and scrutiny apply. So then the question becomes, what level of means and scrutiny? And uh, the, the answer to that is, uh, in this case, intermediate scrutiny. And that's for two reasons. The first is that the permit law here does not burden the core of the Second Amendment right, which is greatest in the home. So the, the permit law, as was previously noted, specifically carves out a, a person's home, it carves out a person's place of business, it carves out uh, transportation between the two, it carves out any other property they might own that's not their home. It carves out all of these areas where the right to self-defense is greatest and only applies in public, where that right is least. Furthermore, uh, as, as Ms. Showalter explained, the permit law is a regulation and not a prohibition. It does not say that no person in New Jersey can have a handgun. It does not, as in Heller, uh, have a, a series of interlocking regulations which de facto make it so that no one can have a handgun. If you can meet the standard, you can have a handgun. And the fact that people... But, but it's, it's a prohibition for Mr. Drake. Yes, Your Honor, it is a prohibition for Mr. Drake, but any regulation is a prohibition for the people who can't meet the requirements of that regulation. And there's quite a few people who won't meet the requirements. There may be a degree of logic in saying that if you reduce the aggregate number of handguns, there may be less violence. But yet, what is the evidence to demonstrate uh, that uh, Tie. You know, in other words, it, it, there's a degree of logic to what you're saying, but does that satisfy intermediate scrutiny when we've enunciated a personal right under the Second Amendment and how? Yes, Your Honor, it does satisfy intermediate scrutiny. So doing, uh, so, so what you're getting at is looking at the reasonable fit between the law and the goal of public safety. And in looking at that reasonable fit, this court can look to a wide range of evidence. As, as this court noted in Florida Bar v. Wentfort, uh, we can look to statistics and studies, 
anecdotes, consensus, history, tradition, and even common sense. All of these are valid forms of evidence to be coming in to show this reasonable fit. And in this case, all of these support uh, the, the reasonableness here. So looking at them in turn. Uh, first, we have studies. We have studies both from the 70s and from today which support the, the reasonable fit here. The 70s are important because that's the last time the permit law was modified. Uh, again, as Ms. Showalter said, it wasn't substantively changed, but the legislature's adoption of the Sicardi language of justifiable need shows that the legislature was reaffirming the law at that time. It had every opportunity to uh, repeal the law if it wanted to, but instead it made it clearer by incorporating the language of Sicardi. So the study mentioned in Sicardi, uh, two in particular, uh, one was by the National Commission on the Causes of Prevention of Violence, which basically concluded that laws like the type in New Jersey uh, led to a, an increase in public safety and a decrease in the number of public homicides and assaults, and in fact suggested uh, that every state and the federal government adopt laws very similar to that in New Jersey. If, if we were here on rational basis review, those studies would be the end of the matter and you would win. But we're here on some higher level of review, perhaps intermediate scrutiny. None of those tests were admitted into evidence. There's no expert testimony. Uh, so far as I know, nobody has said whether those studies meet the Daubert standard and, and would even be properly considered at a district court. Can you give me examples where we've found intermediate scrutiny satisfied without any evidence in the record? Your Honor, we, we disagree that there's no evidence in the record here. We think the references below to Sicardi incorporate the evidence present in, uh, that's described there. We think that the filings, uh, especially at the circuit court level, uh, for example, the amicus brief by the Brady Center, uh, which has its own studies, uh, th these serve as evidence in this case. So we do believe we have evidence on the record, and we're presenting the evidence uh, here now as well. Uh, so even if this court were to determine that the evidence on the record below is insufficient for our dismissal motion, uh, the evidence we're presenting today is certainly sufficient to deny opposing counsel's summary judgment motion and remand the case for further proceedings. Uh, but looking then at, at uh, let's go more specifically. I mean, Mr. Drake, uh, Mr. Mr. Drake takes money from the ATM to the bank. Uh, I mean, the, the, when the Brinks truck comes by, they've got several armed people and, and a big truck. Here's an individual taking money out of the bank machine down to the bank. He can't have a gun. No, Your Honor, because he cannot meet the regulatory standard. And this court isn't being tasked... The Brinks, the Brinks people can have the gun. I assume there's some exception for the Brinks truck. You don't, you don't have unarmed Brinks trucks in New Jersey. I, I don't believe we have unarmed Brink, uh, Brinks trucks. And yes, there are, it is easier for an armored car driver to receive a, a handgun. They have a slightly different permitting mechanism. Uh, but the, the, the question isn't whether or not uh, someone who can't meet the justifiable needs standard might, under uh, some... Uh, view of it, maybe we think they should have a gun. The question is whether or not the standard is uh, reasonably fit to the goal of public safety. And to, do th and to answer that, we need to look beyond just uh, the, the particular plaintiffs in this case. And we need to look at uh, the relationship between uh, a, a large number of easily accessible guns in the public sphere to public safety, which is what uh, the National Commission report uh, describes, which is what, again, in Sicardi, the Attorney General in 1966 testifying before the legislature uh, wa was getting at with regards to a state-by-state -state canvassing. It's what anecdotes, uh, again, looking in the 70s and today, anecdotes from Sicardi of police officers who were never, who were not aware in any, uh, excuse me, were not aware at all uh, of any instances where a gun had been used in New Jersey in public for self-defense successfully, but were aware of a number of instances where the gun had been accidentally discharged, harming the owner or someone else, where the gun had been maliciously used by someone who happened to have a gun on their hip, got hot-headed in an altercation, and decided to use it offensively. So at the end of the oh, I'm sorry, no, no, go ahead. No, no, no. So at the end of the day, we've enunciated a personal right. 
and Heller. Uh, we have intermediate scrutiny, but under your test, very few people, as Justice Hinkle indicated, will ever qualify. Even people who are encountering very dangerous conditions. You, Your Honor, there, there is the individual right, but the individual right is one to self-defense and is greatest in the home. So the fact that we're outside the home here uh, is key, and the fact that the justifiable need uh, standard is designed to get at whether or not someone will be using this weapon for self-defense. How, how many people toting the ATM cash go around committing crimes against other folks? Your Honor, it, I mean, I, I, I go back to, the, to uh, Mr. Drake and how in the world he doesn't have a justifiable need to carry a gun. I, I mean, I'm with you on a lot of that. I mean, I, I understand as a matter of common sense, the, the Chief Justice's question, Fewer guns, maybe less gun violence. Uh, I would think that uh, everybody toting the ATM cash would be a ready target. I, I'm surprised anybody gets to the bank if, if they're toting that kind of money un, unarmed. Your, your, your Honor, I, I share your intuition there, and I honestly am a bit surprised as well that Mr. Drake might not have met this test, but a misapplication of the test by uh, the Superior Court judge would be grounds for an as-applied challenge, not grounds for a facial challenge against the law as a whole. If Mr. Drake has a problem with him not getting uh, a, a gun, that, that's an issue for Mr. Drake, not an issue uh, to take down the law as a whole. I get back to the same concern that the Chief Justice has. It seems to me that almost no one will be able to meet this justifiable need standard. I mean, New Jersey has all these other requirements of background checks, uh, moral character, gun usage, all kinds of things that would be sufficient, one would think, to ensure that a uh, gun is going to be used responsibly by the person who, who has it. And to have this justifiable need standard where you've got to show some specific threat or something of that nature, very few people are going to be able to show that realistically, and unfortunately, a lot of people uh, won't be around, will have been harmed or killed, uh, you know, who otherwise might have needed that, that gun. I mean, they, they're not able to show that they, they have this need, and then something horrible happens to them out in the, the streets or the, whatever the city was that your co-counsel mentioned in New Jersey, uh, 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 some, you know, really tough urban area. So, so it really goes to the issue of fit. I mean, there are all these other requirements that you have here. Your, Your Honor, it, the, the fact that some people might find themselves in an imminent situation where they need to use a weapon and don't have it because they were unable to meet the justifiable needs standard uh, is only half the equation. The other half is looking at the people who are going to be harmed by the, the, the explosion in the number of guns that might result from uh, striking down the justifiable need requirement uh, because of accidental discharge, misuse, malicious use. Uh, and looking at that, uh, in, in addition to the 1970s anecdotes by the Sicardi officers, we can look to events uh, very recently. For example, uh, in, uh, at the end of December, there was a woman in Idaho uh, shopping at a Walmart and her two-year-old reached into her purse, took her gun. It, it's unclear whether or not it was a legal gun, but uh, we, it, it seems probable that it may have been, uh, and killed the woman. Uh, and this is a danger that the New Jersey legislature has sought to avoid by uh, having this justifiable need requirement, which does carve out, as, as I've said, the, the right to have the gun in the home, the ability to have it in public when we're sure that what you're going to be using it for is self-defense, uh, but when we're not sure that that's what the gun is going to be used for, when self-defense might only play a small part in the equation, then New Jersey's uh, decision to limit uh, the widespread availability of handguns is reasonably fit to the, the government end. Aren't we all most likely to be in harm's way, so to speak, outside the home? I mean, it's when you're outside the home that you're uh, most vulnerable, it's when you're um, at risk of confrontations from people who do not mean well. I mean, inside your home, you've got four walls, you have a door, perhaps people assume you have uh, something to defend yourself. But you're really at greatest risk when you're outside the home. So, Your Honor, you may be at greater risk when you're outside the home, uh, but the, the fact that you're at greater risk outside than inside doesn't mean that 
uh, your right to self-defense is higher outside the home. Heller made clear the right to self-defense is greatest inside the home. So whether or not you're... But Heller didn't say that there was no right outside the home. It just said most acute or something of that nature inside the home. Correct. And we recognize, at least at, if, if this court gets to this stage of the arguments, we're recognizing that there is a right outside the home. And the question is whether or not the limit on that right is reasonably fit to the government end of public safety. So looking... Uh, just very quickly at a few of these other uh, pieces of evidence. I've covered studies and anecdotes. Looking at uh, uh, consensus and uh, common sense, we, we've discussed a little bit of common sense, but the, uh, just the basic idea that fewer guns is going to mean fewer accidental discharges, fewer misuses, uh, that is a, a reasonable conclusion to draw. And looking at consensus, as, as my co-counsel pointed out, uh, seven of the 10 most populous, uh, most densely populous states have laws uh, similar to New Jersey's, and in particular, Maryland's is uh, nearly identical uh, and was upheld by the Fourth Circuit very recently as well. You, you, you think that prevalence of laws in the most populous places indicates a judgment that those are dangerous places and this is appropriate, or does it reflect that they have a more liberal uh, voting uh, record? Your Honor, I believe the former. I believe that the, uh, the, the decisions of these legislatures uh, which I, I, I'm not aware of which party was in control of the legislator, legislatures at any given time. Uh, but it, but it's a good bet that New York is one of these that, that has the restriction and Houston is not. You think it's because of the danger in Houston and New York, or you think maybe they vote differently? Your Honor, I think that the legislatures, based on their political beliefs, might have come to different conclusions, but they are, uh, if, if I may briefly finish that, we believe that the reasonableness of the decision, it would have been just as reasonable in Houston to make the decision. They just chose not to. Uh, but it's reasonable when New Jersey does, just as it would be in Houston. So for those reasons, this court should affirm the courts below. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Justice Hinkle, you asked whether or not an innocent bystander in a coffee shop has an interest in not being harmed. And the answer is absolutely. The state is charged with looking after her interests. The respondent's solution to that problem is to say that fewer guns means fewer deaths, and that the court should defer to the legislature's policy judgments on empirical matters. But New Jersey cannot determine how many guns it's willing to tolerate as a matter of public safety and then deprive a subset of law-abiding citizens who have, met, who have met New Jersey's stringent permitting requirements, like Petitioner Drake, of their constitutional rights in order to achieve a magic ratio. An individual's constitutional right may only be imposed upon when the government's means are reasonably necessary to further their substantial interests. And respondents cite Florida Bar versus went for it for the proposition that the court can consider various types of evidence. But in that case, every single piece of alternative evidence that the court considered was incorporated in the district court's record. Respondents also contend that this court should give deference to the legislature's judgments under Turner Broadcasting. But Turner only permits deference once the legislature has provided some substantial evidence. And the respondents have done neither in this case. What, what do you do with, I mean, they say uh, Dodge City, uh, Tombstone, uh, what, what do you do with those? Your Honor, this respondents point to a history of regulating public carry, but those regulations have historically been enacted against the backdrop of a general presumption that individuals uh, had the right to carry in public and that the Constitution protected that right. Now, we don't contend that the government gets to make certain restrictions based on regulations, based on interest in population density or safety. But the, in the face of such a sweeping regulation, New Jersey has provided no evidence as to why it's necessary to impose this requirement, not other requirements, upon its citizens, effectively rationing a constitutional right. Now, Your Honor, I see my time has expired. May I very briefly? Very briefly. Conclude? As the Keller Court noted, the enshrinement of the of Constitutional rights take certain policy choices off the table. Small pockets of freedom don't prevent the destruction of the right. And a constitutional right is no right at all if its exercise is limited to a few people in a few places at a few times. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Counsel. All right, Mr. Marshall, you. All rise. <clears throat>
Okay, well, we'll wait for the judges to deliberate and announce our winner, but let's have a round of applause.
All right. Uh, the court was very impressed with everyone. So we're going to take a moment for everyone to share a few comments. And uh, Justice Hinkle. We talked about whether we should tell you the winners first or make comments. We decided, uh, you know, if we tell you the winners first, you're not going to listen to the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, these people have had all this pressure in there, uh, so a few more minutes won't hurt. <laughs> um, the first thing we said when we got back there was there's not much difference. These, these four are all outstanding. I hope everybody in the audience appreciated just how, how good and how well prepared these are. You know, you always hear that we'd be happy to have you in our court. We, we really would. I've got a pro se case going to trial in a couple of weeks. If you want to take a little time off and come try a case, <laughs> I'd love to have you. The other thing I was going to say is, we, at least for me, I can congratulate the team that's going to be announced as the winner in a minute, but my heart is really with the other side. I, I, I did moot court. I, I lost in the semifinals. Um, we weren't smart enough to handle it with just two, so we had six on the total team. Uh, we, I say we lost in the semifinals. Uh, of, of the six, one has won uh, Pulitzer Prizes. One's a judge on the second circuit. Two of us are district judges. You can survive not being on the winner team. <laughs> Justice Cole? Well, uh, I'd say I felt a lot of pressure um, today judging this because uh, what I think without a doubt is my best law clerk uh, ever, Professor Miller, is here. So I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> I, I can't embarrass him and, you know, in front of all of his colleagues and, and students. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, we got back to the roving room and, and, and just all said the same thing, what Justice Hinkle said, just uh, was a, just a very strong... Uh, impressive argument by all four of you. Um, so I'll compare it to what I see, um, you know, regularly in, in the Sixth Circuit, where I think we have fine and able counsel, and many times some of the uh, most, most able and, and well-known in the country. And I thought the four of you uh, were as, every bit as prepared as, as those uh, really uh, first-rate counsel are. Uh, you had your arguments um, well organized. You presented them effectively. You had good, you know, eye contact. You weren't uh, committed to your your notes. You obviously reviewed, you know, your your uh, presentation extensively uh, before today, and you were very comfortable with the arguments that you made. I thought when you were asked questions, you pivoted well uh, when you needed to get back to. You answered the questions, which is always important. Uh, I found many times lawyers do not want to answer the questions that the justices pose. They want to answer the question that they want answered, <laughs> understandably. But you have to listen to the, the judge's questions, and I thought the four of you did that. <clears throat> and you looked at the judge, uh, justice who was asking the question, and you responded to it. At the same time, you made sure, to the best that you could, to cover all the points you needed to cover. So uh, I'm very impressed, uh, I can say to, uh, you know, management here, <laughs> that uh, your students have, have acquitted themselves to spectacularly. And um, I would be pleased to have any of the four of you come to the Sixth Circuit and argue uh, a case even at this point in your career. Chief? Thank you, Justice Cole. Well, I totally concur with my colleagues. Everyone just did extraordinary, and it would be an honor to have any of you come and argue at the NC Supreme Court. Uh, as with all competitions, it has been given to me the responsibility to share the winner of the 2015 Duke Cup and the winning team, Council for Respondents. And it also gives me great pleasure to announce the best oralist, Annie Showalter. All right. Well, I think that completes our business, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Discharge. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>